for the record anyway, since it's being recorded, uh, this, this presentation is primarily, was initially primarily for uh, a legislative staff, but it's, it's good to share this with everyone, the history of the band. Uh, we, we did uh, just pass a legislative order uh, making a, uh, a section of legislative staff permanent, uh, permanent uh, uh, employees and uh, to help uh, that core staff kind of retain information and provide continuity to the, uh, to the uh, staff here for the uh, future elected officials. Um, this training is uh, for uh, history about where we've been. And uh, Don has been around part of the, uh, the made it a point to, uh, uh, I keep that stuff together and as a, as a, I'm taking it as a, um, as a, as a passion of, of, of sorts. Right. And um, he's here to share uh, um, his experiences um, in, in three sets, right? And, and we'll, have, we'll have three sessions. And um, with that, uh, we can go around the room, everybody, for just for Don's. Pete Nicolini. Adam Candler, incoming Legis Legislative Council. Keen. Val Harrington. And Sheldon Boyd. Who's all on the call? I think they went through that. Margaret Burrell. Okay, that's fine. It's going to be recorded anyway, so yeah. go ahead, Don. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Just a little bit of my background to start this. Um, I came to work for Mille Lacs Band in 1974, uh, and I was hired as a math tutor to work in the public school system to assist students with mathematic problems that they had. And it was under a Title IV B grant uh, under Indian education from the federal government that the reservation had drafted and thought that they needed a, a, a tutor to help students. And that was my initial job. Uh, and that's how I got started working for the band. I, I grew up in western Minnesota and I attended um, Moorhead State University where I got a degree in mathematics and teaching that I applied for that position and ended up with it. So a lot of things happened since then, um, and I will try to explain much of that through the history of, of the band. And uh, at the time, Arthur Gobble was the chairman of Mille Lacs, and uh, he implemented a wide range of changes in the government and different things about the government that uh, we're all dealing with today. And so I'll just start with a kind of a history. If I can make this work. I think it's important to kind of figure out when the band arrived in this region. Um, it's basically what was happening in North America as as the eastern seaboard got colonized, all the tribes that lived there got pushed west. And the Ojibwe got pushed, and they also had uh, um, they were also had a vision about where they were going to go. And that vision included where the food grows on the water. And if you look at the early history book of Mille Lacs, it was written in 1984, and I see that I have a mistake in the spelling of Mille Lacs there. Um, but it's called the, Against the Tide of American History, the Story of the Mille Lacs Anishinaabe. And I believe in the archives here they have still probably 50 or so of those books available. If nobody's seen those, uh, it's a good book to read. It was written by Roger Buffalo Head. I was asked to chair the committee on it, and that's kind of got me 
first introduction into the history of Malads. Um, and it, it goes through the migration story of the Ojibwe, uh, the early conflict. The Dakota people lived in the Malads Lake. They called it the Spirit Lake, and the Rum River was the Spirit River. And that's why it's called the Rum River, because in the translation from spirit to spirits of rum as how it got translated and so they call it the rum river when it was really the spirit river from Malax Lake that went out into the Mississippi River and then out into the larger ocean as a whole. And so that's part of the Dakota understanding. Uh, the reason the Ojibwe and the Dakota got into a conflict according to the oral history, original oral history, and it was recorded by uh, William Warren, the history of the Ojibwe, was that uh, a family, uh, four sons that lived up by Duluth, uh, the sons came down to Mille Lacs to visit and feast, and during that process, uh, one of the sons was killed, and they, the other three returned and told the father that uh, their one son had been killed, and then they discussed it, and they thought, well, maybe that was an accident about what had happened. So the three sons went back, and on the second trip, two more sons were killed. And the, one son went back and told the father what had happened, and they again concluded that maybe it was an accident. And so the fourth son came back for a feast, and then he was killed. And so that was what was the implementation of the Dakota getting pushed out of here. The Ojibwe came down and forced them out, and that happened in about 1745. And, and just, you know, the numbers, dates like that really don't kind of, are hard to visualize what's 1745. But that's 30 years before the United States even existed. So if you think about it that way, it helps kind of put in reference what was going on. So 30 years before there was even a thought of the United States, that when this conflict was happening. And so, as, as this conflict, and, and like Doug Sam, I don't, some of you know Doug Sam, he, when I first came here, he told me about his grandmother remembered when this was happening, and had stories as a little child about when this conflict happened. So it was within the memory of people that were alive back in 1970 or you know, so there was a lot of interesting dynamics about the history. And after the United States became the country, 1776, it developed policy relating to Indian tribes. And I, I feel this is kind of important for staff people to understand this kind of fundamental basis for why tribes exist, how they exist, what the rationality for that is. And in this case, the United States developed this uh, treaty relation process with Indian tribes, not because the United States thought that that was important, but because the British in the Revolutionary War in the Treaty of Versailles required the United States to deal with native people as sovereign entities. And the reason that was part of the law, the international law, was because in North America, when the various countries explored they figured out pretty quickly that tribal people controlled the balance of power in North America. And if they swung that power against them, 
that was a problem. And so they developed these rules in Europe about how to deal with North America. South America was a little different, but in North America they developed these rules that you had to negotiate with the tribal people before you could claim their land. And this was all part of the right of discovery. Um, and these were all rules set up to protect the balance of power because they would lose that the balance of power when things shifted. If tribal people leaned favorably to one country, that could destroy all the area that they were trying to develop or claim or exploit or colonize. Uh, and it was really important that uh, they maintain these rules amongst the European countries so that they didn't get into these conflicts. And so when the United States became a separate country, it had to adopt those principles of dealing with tribes in a fair and equitable way. And the, the mechanism to deal with them was through treaty. They were viewed as a sovereign entity. And, and so those types of things became incorporated into the US law and into the US Constitution. Indian tribes are mentioned in the Constitution of the United States, I think, in three areas. And so those are all things because of the United States being becoming independent of Britain had to adopt those kinds of principles and those principles then became the basis for Indian policy in the United States. And I think originally, if you look at the early history, when the United States government talked about Indian tribes, it referred to them as our red brother. And they even had plans to put seats in Congress for their red brother. And that's when the United States was still weak militarily. By about 1800, when the United States had developed its military complex, now the role shifted from our red brother to our red children. And that symbol, or that shift in recognition, uh, stayed and still somewhat exists today in the ward guardianship relationship between the United States and, and Indian tribes. And so uh, that, it shifted when the military power shifted. And by, before 1800, tribes in the United States still had the military might if they wanted to, they could have driven everybody out of North America. They had that power. They didn't exercise it. There were different leaders, Tecumseh for one, who talked about doing that, trying to make that happen, but the tribes didn't make it happen. And you can second guess that decision, but yes. But then by 1800, the development of modern warfare kind of things like cannons and that type of thing became prevalent in the Army of the United States. And that changed that balance of power between tribes. And they no longer had the military power to just destroy everything if they would have chose to do that. So that was kind of the change. And with that change then came the change of policy about how to deal with tribes. And so the early policies, shifted then, uh, the policy shifted and, and the United States started the developing interactions with Indian tribes. And one of the things in that first policy was separate Indian people from white people. And some of us have seen that in the history of how they move tribes west. One of the most significance of that is that Cherokee out of Georgia, the Trail of Tears, 
separating Indian tribes from non-Indian people. And part of that was a system because of they were, quote, worried about conflict, but in the Cherokee case, it was just worried about economic value that they could get by taking Indian property, Indian development, and, and owning it and selling it. And if you look across the history of the United States, that was always the intent, was to take things, possessions that Indian tribes had and exploit that to make money and, and expand economics. In this region, the first major treaty that the Ojibwe were involved with was in 1825. And it was a treaty of Perry Duchesne, and it included not just only the Ojibwe, but it included the Dakota, the Fox, Sac and Fox, and a number of other tribes. And what it did, or what the United States came in and said was, what we want to do is create peace amongst the tribes. Because as tribes were getting pushed west, there was conflicts over land, over resources, between tribal people because one tribe was living there and other tribe starts to move in and people are saying, whoa, where are you coming from? And, and all of that required then conflict and as a result, the United States said, what we want to do is separate that out and, and define where every tribe is. And so the biggest two tribes, and they were, for example, the Ojibwe were referred to as Chippewa, and the Chippewa Nation. And in the treaty itself, it referred to, it referred to the, the Ojibwe as the Great Chippewa Nation. And today you hear about tribes being talked about nation, you know, where the Anishinaabe Nation, and that really comes from way back in 1825, this, this uh, idea about that they were a nation. And just kind of a, a description of why nation versus a tribe versus a band versus a group versus a family. In, in anthropology, um, if you have a group of people that are related, they can be called a band. If you have a multiple groups of bands joined together in some configuration, that can be called a tribe. And then if all of the people of that tribe are together, then that can be called a nation. So they have this kind of hierarchy about how where things fit. And so the Malax band was really a, a lot of related people. Uh, and what Malax consists of today are various bands. And, and then you got the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, which is a configuration of different bands also. And so you could have, you could call Malax a tribe, and sometimes those things get used interchangeably because there are various bands, members, that are different ancestry. They, their, their clans are different, so they're either the Bullhead clan, uh, the Mayingan clan, the Wolf clan, um, there's the Wabajeshi, the, the Martin clan, uh, there's the Eagle clan, there's Bobcat or Lion Clan, and all these clans have different associations that all live in this area. And people still remember, a lot of people still remember which clan they belong to. And if, in funerals, a lot of times there's a marker which represents that clan the person is from. And uh, originally in 1825, the Wolf Clan was predominant at Mille Lacs, and it was under the leadership of Naguanabe. And, and so in 1825, 
what the United States government did was got agreement between the Dakota or the great Sioux Nation and the great Chippewa Nation as to where the line was between their two countries, essentially. And the line became, it's called the 1837 line. It was surveyed, but the easiest way to remember it is I-94. If you think about I-94 that runs across Minnesota, that was, that was pretty close to where the division between the Dakota and the Ojibwe was. And there was another reference that was given by a member of the Mille Lacs band was that uh, it's where the birch trees stop. When the birch trees stopped growing, that's where the dividing line was between the two groups of people. And so that's still out there in the sense. And what the United States said in 1825 is, we don't want your land, we just want peace, and blah, 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 blah. Then in 1837, the United States government came back, both to the Dakota and to the Ojibwe, and said, okay, this is your land. We want to buy it. And there was a big discussion about whether that was going to happen or not. And many people wonder why tribes consented to sell their land. And I've thought about that issue a lot, too. Why didn't they just say no? Why, you know, why didn't they? But they also understood the power of the United States. And in particular, many leaders were taken to Washington, D.C. and shown the Navy, they were shown the military, they were shown all the big buildings that were there. And there was a subtle indication that if you don't agree with us, We'll just take it. Um, the other one was, and I think that, and I think this more lately, is that they showed how by putting people on the land, and I don't think they really understood taxes, but I think they got the idea that somehow all these people on the land would create these big buildings and success for them. And there was, there was a lot of talk about that the great white father would take care of his red children and make them prosper. And, and by what I think they said informally was, we'll bring in people to work the land and then we'll take a little bit of money from them and give it to you and you'll prosper with that. And I think there's this underlying concept that that's how things are going to work. And by looking at what was going on in Washington, tribes could kind of visualize that that was the case. Because that's how that all got built. And so I think that somewhere in there, there was this idea that helps tribal leaders say, well, you know, we're kind of caught in this crazy world that we're in, and we have to do something, and so what's the best thing we can do? And I think they concluded that selling the land was something they could do. Now in 1837, one of the things that they did was they reserved the right to hunt and fish on the land that was sold, or seeded as it was called. And as all of you probably know, that Mille Lacs went through a very long litigation about how that right to hunt, fish, and gather was acknowledged by the United States Supreme Court. And I don't know if we'll get, I don't think we'll talk about all of that today because we'll talk about that when we get into the time period of the eight, 1980s. And that's when all of this was starting to develop. And then we'll talk about how that all come together. But there, they, the leadership in 1837 had the forethought to put into the treaty the right to hunt, fish, and gather 
on the lands hereby ceded. Uh, initially, the leaders wanted to lease the land to the United States. They said, well, we'll just lease it to you for a set period of time. And the negotiators for the United States said, no, the United States doesn't lease land. It either buys it or it doesn't, or it takes it, but it doesn't lease it. And so that would have been an interesting development if the 1837 would have been leased and the tribe would have had this underground, underlying right. I don't know if anybody followed that the Supreme Court just ruled about in Oklahoma uh, the underlying right of reservations that now come up through the most of Oklahoma. And there's going to be some interesting developments on how that's all going to work out. But anyway, there was an 1837 land session. There were subsequent sessions of 1847, 1848. There was a session in 1854 and a session in 1855. And I got a map I'm going to bring up. And this is a map of the United States, or of, of Minnesota. And it doesn't have the dates of the sessions on there. But if we look at it, um, if you look at the lower part of the state of Minnesota, you can kind of see there's an orangish colored area. And there's kind of a diagonal line that runs across there that would follow pretty close to I-94. Anyway, that line right there, that's the 1837 boundary that was established. And it ran across Minnesota, it went up into North Dakota, and it went east across Wisconsin, describing which land sessions were owned by the Ojibwe, which were owned by the Dakota. This lower part, this part, that was Dakota territory. And they ceded that land in 1851 to the United States government. And that land ran all the way to the Missouri River. Now in the early maps, the Missouri River was just on the other side of Minnesota. I mean, just because nobody knew the distances between things. And so the early map makers in the 1850s had the Missouri River just kind of like right next to Minnesota, when in fact it's a long ways from Minnesota. But anyway, this was a, a land session in 1851. Um, the Dakota, this little gray area here, um, that, that was a session of 1837 by the Dakota people. Uh, I haven't really read their treaty to see if they reserved any rights to hunt, fish, and gather, but they ceded that portion of the land. And this land right here, that's the 1837 treaty ceded by Mille Lacs and the other Ojibwe in Minnesota, Michigan, uh, and Wisconsin. And then, um, we move over here. This session of land was in 1847. That area here, it's like, it's uh, on the west of the Mississippi. Um, it's like Long Prairie, that region of the country, Staples on the top end. Um, that was seated in 1847, and the next session, this one, that was seated in 1848. And it got narrowed down here because it was close, you know, a relatively small area, and a, a fella named Hole in the Day uh, negotiated those treaties. And Mille Lacs people who somewhat 
hunted at Long Prairie, they hunted buffalo at Long Prairie, there's a record of them going over to Long Prairie and hunting buffalo. Uh, got, somehow they got excluded from that land sessions. And as a result, they had some resentment against Hole in the Day. And Hole in the Day uh, became kind of a famous uh, individual in Minnesota and still is today. I think that uh, some history, uh, Anthony Troyer just produced a history of the assassination of Hole in the Day. And, um, and Hole in the Day claimed to be the chief of all the Ojibwe. And there was His father was Hole in the Day One, and he came from in Michigan and moved over by Little Falls and lived there. And, and he had a son named Hole in the Day that took the name Hole in the Day also, which was kind of unusual because in the Ojibwe culture, uh, names weren't followed like today where your father, you get your father's surname wasn't, wasn't the way it was done in Ojibwe culture. What you had was something called wetans, and they were namers or namesakes for you. And then usually one of those wetans would give you a name that was related to them, not to your family or your biological parents but was related to them. And so when you hear of people with Ojibwe names and that were given a namesake, that namesake usually used their namesake as the way to get that name. So it wasn't, you know, like a boy. You wouldn't be named boy, you'd be named maybe gobble or first standing, uh, last standing, all those kinds of things would, you know, and that would come from the namesake and that's how your Indian name was developed. So it's sort of interesting that Hole in the Day took his father's name because that wasn't the standard cultural practice going on. Um, but he did and he became Hole in the Day, sometimes called Hole in the Day too, or Hole in the Day the Boy. He was sense. But anyway, Hole in the Day claimed to be the leader of all the Ojibwe. And most Ojibwe didn't challenge that to any really extent. In Wisconsin, there was an Ojibwe named Buffalo, and he was also claimed or recognized as the leader of all the Ojibwe. So there were these kind of ongoing speeches or thoughts about who the leaders were and how that all occurred. But anyway, I want to go, oh, I know, I want to finish this up. Um, so those were the, those were two of the sessions, 1857 and 1850, or 47 and 1848, and then this, session here, the Arrowhead region of the United States, or Minnesota, that was seated in 1854. And a whole bunch of interesting things happened in that treaty of 1854. The United States now created reservations, and they realized that the idea of moving tribal people somewhere else wasn't going to work because there was no place else to move them. And the main place they were moving people were Oklahoma. And Oklahoma was going to become an Indian state all at one time. The idea that it would be a state that would be comprised of all the Indian tribes in the United States. Um, there was a certain amount of concern amongst the Ojibwe, and you can see it in some correspondence, that they didn't want to move to Oklahoma. That was not in their 
desires or and they were going to resist that if that was going to be the case and so the united states i think recognized that that would be a huge conflict to try to remove the ojibwe in oklahoma and so they determined the next best option was to create reservations so in 1854 what they created was the grand portage reservation and the fond du lac reservation in that arrowhead region and then in this lower part in wisconsin This yellow area extended all the way to Michigan, so some 12 million acres. So it was a big land session in 1857. And there was a, and it doesn't show on here, but up above here, you see where that line, the straight line comes across the north end of Mille Lacs Lake and runs across Wisconsin. If you think about that going all the way to it would be about right there. That would run all the way to the state of Michigan border, that line. There's a little piece of land up above that that wasn't seeded. And that was seeded in Wisconsin in 1842. And the way the United States bought land and seeded those lands was it was kind of like a mortgage. They, the treaty basically said, we're going to buy this land for you. And we're going to pay you off over 30 years and every year we're going to pay you some money. And that's where the annuity payments came from, and traders, and that's a whole history of that is very uh, difficult to, to read about because of the corruptness in, in a lot of that that went on. Um, the United States government at that time only paid in gold. So tribal people were given gold coins every year at these annual payments. And then anybody or everybody went after to get that money. And they weren't used to coins, gold coins. So sometimes they'd pound them out and make ornaments out of them. Um, or silver coins, they'd pound them out and make ornaments out of them. Um, and then people would take them and exchange stuff with them. Traders would charge them exorbitant amounts of money to, to, for guns and ammunition and all these kinds of things. So that's, that was the real economic conflict that went on with the, the annuity payments. Um, to some extent today, we have a similar type of thing going on with the per cap payments. Somebody was just asking me the other day, what does Brainerd think when the band gives out a per cap? I said, Brainerd thinks a lot about that. <laughs> because that's a huge amount of money that comes into Brainerd when those per cap checks go out. Um, there's a lot of spending going on in Brainerd on the week that per caps come out, and those business capitalize on it. Whether some of them omit it or not, that's another question. But in general, Brainerd, I think, does admit that that's a significant economic value to them when the band does a per cap payment. And similarly, in the old days, there was called annuity payments, and they got the same, there was the same type of thing. And, and that was extremely valuable where those payments were made and where that money ended up getting spent. Now, prior to 1854, all of the per caps were given out at Madeline Island and in Lake Superior. That was a focal point of the Ojibwe. And there was a couple traders there that did excellent because all of the Ojibwe had to go to Madeline Island to get their money. Um, and so in the 1854 treaty, they also created reservations in Wisconsin in the 37 and the 42 ceded territory. And so reservations like Red Cliff, Bad River, Lac de Flambeau, Le Couturier, those reservations were created in 1854 um, as a place 
for tribal people. And part of the reason that was all happening was the 1837 treaty, the language to hunt, fish, and gather, had a clause in it that said, during the pleasure of the president. And that particular quote, the pleasure of the president, became a very intense litigated item when this litigation happened in the 18, or the 1990s. And what did that mean? And what happened was that some businessmen in Minneapolis got talking to the President of the United States and said, let's move all the Chippewa that live on the 1837 ceded territory west of the Mississippi. And then we'll just pay them wherever they live west of the Mississippi. Where do you think that money would get spent if they were all west of the Mississippi? It would get spent in Minneapolis. When the check, when the money was paid in, in uh, La Pointe, Madeline Island, that money got spent in, in Madison and in Chicago because they moved back in that direction. So those monies were important and it was really the only money in that whole region of the United States. It was the tribal money that was coming in, paying for the land that the United States bought. And so there was tremendous economic value to where that money got distributed. And so there was, and so Zachary Taylor issued a removal order to remove all of the Ojibwe west of the Mississippi. And then accomplish that, they said the annuity payments in 1850 were going to occur at Sandy Lake. And so all the Ojibwe in Wisconsin, part of Michigan, had to walk to Sandy Lake to get their annuity payment. When they got there, the government said, well, we don't have it yet. You'll have to wait with the idea that they would stay there and start developing residency. And so they delayed the distribution of those annuity payments. Well, there was a lot of influx of people at Sandy Lake, and pretty soon they hunted everything out so there was no food left. And the government still didn't release any annuities. And then disease came in, measles and things. And so people started dying. And some of you know George Abbott, but he told me one day as we were riding on the east side of Sandy Lake, he said, look across there and you see that big bank along the west side of Sandy Lake, he said. He said, when they had the people over here, removed the people over here, so many died that that whole bank looked like it still had snow on it because they used birch bark to wrap up the bodies, that the whole side was covered with white birch bark container where people had been had perished moving over. And it, it's, uh, it, it was written up at the, and every year now, the Ojibwe at Sandy Lake, I think, I think it's in July 27th, they have a ceremony there. If you go to the Corps of Engineers landing on the west side of uh, Big Sandy Lake, there's a big rock a monument there for the people that perished at that time. It was developed. But anyway, that removal order by Zachary Taylor then really shook people up, tribal people up. But it also shook up business people in Madison <laughs> and uh, Chicago, because they were worried their money wasn't going to come back their way. And so they got, they got a, the, the president not to implement the order. And so by the time they distributed the payments, it was, this, it was in December, and then all the Ojibwe from Wisconsin, Michigan walked back. And, uh, 
some 500 froze to death. A storm came in, and and there was another really tragic uh, thing that happened there. But that removal order um, was used later in regards to the hunting and fishing right case, saying uh, the president removed the right under this executive order. So when a current president is throwing out all these executive orders, uh, people have to keep an eye on what they're doing because some of them can have long-range consequences in the future. And this, this removal order stayed there. But essentially, when they recreated the reservations in, in Wisconsin in 1854, Congress said, no, these are permanent homes. So the removal order was in direct conflict with, with removing the tribal people because they gave them permanent homes. They gave them reservations. So it kind of undercut the executive order of the president. So anyway, that's, that would happen in 1854. The other thing 1854 did was it separated the Ojibwe. They were, uh, up to that point, they were referred to as a, a nation. Um, and at, at 1854, they put a clause in there that said that all of the tribes, the Ojibwe, along Lake Superior shall be called the Lake Superior Bands of Chippewa. And so if you look at Fond du Lac as its title, it's Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. If you look at Grand Portage, it's the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Red Lake, or Red, Red Cliff, it's the Lake Superior Band, Red Cliff, Lake Superior Band, Bad River, and so on. They're all referred to as Lake Superior. Everything west of that was given a different title. And in the lower area, it was referred to as the Chippewa of the Mississippi. And it also divided the way annuity payments would be made after that. That two-thirds of the money would go to the Chippewa of Lake Superior, and one-third would go to the other Chippewa west of there. So they divided so that and I don't know if anybody remembers, but when they had the docket payments years ago, um, there was this different value that everybody was getting. And that was all as a result of, of this 1854 treaty and the shifting of how annuity payments were made. They weren't equal anymore. They were two-thirds to the Lake Superior and one-third to the Chippewa west of, of the Lake Superior groups. So that, that also created some conflict. So the next land session, this big area right there, the gray area, that session was in 1855. So a year later, after 1854, the next year the United States came back and wanted to buy that large tract of land. And that that negotiation was happening in Washington, D.C. in December. And Hole in the Day led a contingency to Washington, D.C. to negotiate that treaty. And just one more thing here. Hole in the Day lived right there. That I'll, I'll give you a blown up picture of that in a little bit later. Um, that's where Holland Bay lived. And that reservation there was called the Gull Lake Reservation. Um, but he went to Washington with a contingency to sell that, black, that tract of land. Malax was excluded and not asked to go along. And when Malax heard that this was happening, they sent a letter to the governor, who was the Indian agent also in Minnesota, that if Hole in the Day sells 
any Malak's lamb, they will kill him before he returns. So they were pretty upset about what was going on. And part of that occurred because of the 1847 and 48 treaties. That sessions were made and Malax was excluded, and so they weren't going to let that happen again. And if they hadn't done that, hadn't interjected themselves into that negotiation, there would be no Malax reservation today. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be there. Um, and but they did interject themselves, and they did tell the governor that they wanted to go. So Shabashkin left here in the middle of December to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, talk about a hike. That had to be pretty interesting travel to make that all happen. Because he had to walk to Minneapolis. And then at least what I've been able to calculate is there were barges yet still running on the Mississippi that hadn't froze over completely. So they take a barge down to uh, down the Mississippi and they catch another um, trail that would take them into Chicago. And then once they got to Chicago there was a train between Chicago and New York and they'd get on the train and ride that and then they'd come down to DC from there. So they had a pretty exceptional uh, trip that they were on uh, to handle all this. In the meantime, they arrived late at the negotiations uh, of 1855. And the hole in the day's negotiating strategy was that he wanted the right to vote. Tribal people didn't have the right to vote in the United States. And he wanted the right to vote. And he had, there's some indication that he had ideas that he wanted to be the senator from Minnesota. And if he would have gotten the Ojibwe the right to vote, they probably could have voted him in to be the senator. But that would have changed a lot of dynamics in the law if, if that would have happened. But uh, the commissioner, would not consent to that. And at the end, the hole in the day kind of caved in and just said, okay, what are we going to do? And that was the end. And so there wasn't a provision about hunting and fishing put in the 1855 treaty. There was a provision put in the 1854 treaty to hunt and fish, but in the 1855 treaty, there wasn't a provision to hunt. And in, in actuality, uh, tribal people would have never agreed to not having the right to hunt and fish. Because that would have meant to say, you don't have the right to breathe the air. You know, you can't breathe any air anymore. Well, that just means you're going to die. And so they just wouldn't have even thought about that you couldn't hunt and fish. That would, but it's not in there, so it makes the issue of whether or not there's a reserved right to hunt and fish in the 1855 seed a little more difficult to litigate out. Um, and I don't know if people are aware, but there's a group that are trying to litigate the 1854-5 treaty boundaries right now, off-reservation hunting and fishing rights. And that's wider than Leech Lake, and um, I'm not sure if Mille Lacs is part of that or not. They were part of it originally, and now they, they were withdrew from it, and I don't know if they're back in there, involved or not. And anyway, um, there's a group from Sandy Lake that are involved with that, and East Lake that are involved with that. And so those are all things turning around the 1855 ceded territory that are current issues right here today. Uh, and that is whether there's an off-reservation hunting and fishing right in the 55 territory. But, um, you know, tribal people would have never understood that they could hunt the fish. That was, that was just, just would never understood that.
So anyway, um, let me give you that blow up now. And you can kind of see now that it's called 268. Those are, are called Royce lines. There was a guy in the ethnology department of the United States government who was charged with going across the United States and figuring out how the United States acquired all the land it acquired. And he put together a book and it's called the Royce Lines. And it goes through each tract of land and describes how that came into possession of the United States. And so that 268, that was the 47 ceded, ceded lands from the Treaty of 1847. The 269, that was the 1848 seated one. Um, you see the 242 there, that was the 1837 one. Um, the 357, that's the 1855 one. And if you see those pink areas, or I don't know if they're pink or orange, um, oops, right there. That's Gull Lake Reservation. And there's actually a number that goes with it there, 253. The next reservation up that was part of the Chippewa of the Mississippi that was described in 1855, that right there, that was Rabbit Lake Reservation by Crosby. Um, if we go up, way up the Mississippi River, This is up by Grand Rapids, and that's the Pokegama Reservation. And then if you come down here and go over here, oops, right there, that's the Sandy Lake Reservation. And right below that, it doesn't show up very well, um, is the Rice Lake Reservation. And Rice Lake Reservation was very small. It was a half a section of land, 320 acres. So it's not a large reservation like some of these other reservations. And they did, at the time, in Washington, D.C., when they were making these treaties, they had things laid out, like how far was a mile. So when they talked about descriptions of land, how how far was a section of land, a township, six miles, how long that was. And so there were various things. Most of the reservations were described in meets and bounds, which means from the point of where the Crow Wing River enters the Mississippi, that's the southernmost point of this reservation. Then go up the Mississippi River until you hit Pine River and then go directly due north till you hit the most furthest point of the next river and then come south along some, some line like that. Those are called meets and bounds descriptions. Mille Lacs Reservation is somewhat unique in that it was all given in sections and townships and ranges. So they were townships laid out. And that's why Mille Lacs is so square on the bottom. It actually follows the four townships on the south end of Mille Lacs Lake. Now, when the people came back, they understood it was six miles back from the shore of the lake because they, they argued that they didn't want their township to be in the lake because they couldn't live there. And, but when they wrote the treaty itself, the description of the townships you know, particularly the southern ones all fell in the lake. But they had argued that it was six miles back from the lake. And so originally when, when I was looking at the history of this, we were looking at that and trying to figure out, well, did that, you know, how come it's this if it was that, you know? But I went to the land office records that the land office for this area was St. Cloud, and I looked at the land records back in the 1850s and 60s. 
on the outside of one of the land records books that covered the area of Mille Lacs Lake. It had nothing within six miles. <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought, well, what does that mean? <laughs> nothing within six miles. And then I looked to see where homesteads were allowed. And they were scattered around and it was hard to see anything. But ultimately what that meant was that they weren't supposed to give anybody homesteads within six miles of Mille Lacs Lake. And if you looked at it from that point, you can see where the homesteads came right up to that six mile line and then it stopped. And that, that whole area then was reserved at the time for the Mille Lacs Reservation. But ultimately, the legal descriptions carried out and that's the current boundary line that's being litigated right now in federal court by the Mille Lacs Bank. So all these things that were interesting in the sense of how, you know, people were negotiating things, things were being described, the technical issues of, you know, a legal description versus a meander description, how all of those things interplay. One of the interesting things about Rabbit Lake is that's where the Cuyuna mines, iron mines, were all came from. And, uh, and what happened to the people, the tribal people that lived there. I've been doing some research on there, and years ago, um, I was riding with, and I, I think it was Jess Boyd and another boy, and Art, and we were up there, and the boys said, we have land up here. And I said, okay, where? And they said, well, by Rabbit Lake. And I said, okay. But we never got beyond that as to, you know, where in particular that land might be. And so I've been kind of studying that uh, I wrote a little paper about Rabbit Lake for your brother. And, uh, but how that all disappeared, you know, how did, why is, you know, why didn't that continue? And one of the things I found was all of Rabbit Lake had been allotted. The, the leader at Rabbit Lake, he was called Crossing Sky. He was a pretty dynamic individual. In 1850, he went to Washington, D.C., talked to the president, got the president to agree to give him a sawmill. <laughs> and so they brought a sawmill up to Gull Lake, or not to Gull Lake, but up to the, the mouth where the Crow Wing River enters the Mississippi River, and they established a sawmill. It was driven by horses. Horses were put on a track like a Tracks. Mm -hmm. So they put four horses on a track, and these horses walked all day long, and that spun a shaft that spun the saw that cut the lumber. And they made lumber, and they sold lumber. They had a lumber industry going. And uh, they, so he was, he was kind of an interesting fellow, that, uh, what he had all thought out. And he had everybody got an allotment of 80 acres on the Rabbit Lake Reservation. I haven't been able to find where that information was, you know, like how it was, where it was put, but there's records that it was there. And now you, you look in the county records, there's no track of people missing from any of that. So it's a question of how did that change? Is there records of removal or the consolidation? There is, and we're we're moving towards that. Uh, here are the six bands of the Chippewa of the Mississippi. And I, I want to talk a little bit about what was going on in that time period, 1840s to 1862. Um, you know, there was the land sessions we talked about, trips to Washington, sawmill development, 
the Dakota conflict, our conflict with the Dakota, one of the stories that was told to me years ago, I don't know if anybody knew Jenny Mitchell, mm -hmm. Sam Mitchell's wife. Um, she was telling me one day about her grandfather, and she said his name was Kegadusha Kid. And uh, so she was saying that what had happened to him and, and how come he was so opposed to the Dakota was that his brother and his brother's wife had went to Minneapolis to get flour. And when they were coming back on the, by the Rum River, they were attacked by Dakota warriors. And Kegadushi's brother was killed, and his wife had the gun pointed in her eyes and was told to run. And if she made it across the river, she would be safe. And if she didn't, she'd be, they'd kill her. And so she ran, and she had a baby on her back in a Dickenhagen, and Jenny said that uh, the baby's hand flew out, and one of the villains shot the fingers off the hand of the baby. So when she got across the river and stopped, there was blood, but blood was from the baby, and she wrapped it up and then ran back to Mille Lacs and told what happened. So that was a story that she told me, and and the, that was told to her, and and that's why Malax wouldn't join the Dakota in the Dakota conflict in 1862. That incident stayed there as a as an issue. And so I didn't know anything about how these things all interrelated. 1862 conflict. I knew that in Minnesota there was something called, when I went to school, it was called the Sioux Uprising. And in sixth grade you studied that. And one of the things that I always remembered was that, you know, what had happened was that a trader, when the tribal people came and, and wanted some food, he said, well, if you're hungry, go eat grass. And then when they, the, conflict broke out. They found him later with his mouth stuffed full of grass. And uh, in recent times, uh, in the revising of Minnesota history, I sat on a committee and, uh, with the Minnesota Historical Society, and they wanted to remove that from the history, that particular incident. They thought that was a little too violent or something. <laughs> And uh, some of us pushed back on that and said, well, you know, of all the things I remember, that was one thing I remembered, and it seemed somewhat justifiable that that's what should have happened to the guy, you know. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't know if that's still in the Minnesota Indian curriculum or whatever, but uh, that was an issue that when I went to school I remembered. And so I didn't understand the relationship of Mille Lacs to the 1862 conflict and how that all occurred. There was a number of things happening that were going on. Uh, there was a peddler that was coming up from uh, Little Falls and he was killed by some tribal people, a couple tribal men killed him. And uh, that created a controversy. They arrested the two people and then Little Falls uh, got a posse in or a, a mob and they lynched those guys and hung them. Uh, there's another incident in Brainerd where tribal people were hung. Uh, that was a different set of events. But um, anyway, so all these things are going on. Um, up the Crow Wing, uh, there was something called Old Crow Wing. It was a town developed by Clement Bolio. It's on the Crow Wing River, enters the Mississippi River. That's also the checkpoint for the sawmill. It's also the checkpoint of the 1837 treaty boundary line 
where the Crow Wing enters in Mississippi is a, a meets and bounds description of where that line is that runs north or east across to Michigan. And so all of these things are hooked around that. And, and the tip of Gull Lake Reservation on the west side of the Mississippi at Crow Wing, just that's where the reservation bottom boundary of the Gull Lake Reservation Holden today had a house there, a big log house. He had a library uh, in his house. He was pretty, pretty entrepreneurial kind of a guy. He had a ferry that uh, charged people a ride to cross the river. He didn't ride across the river on the ferry. Um, so he had all kinds of things going on there. One of the things is he had a gun that uh, President Pierce gave him, it was a, a revolving rifle. It had a cylinder like a, like a Colt 45 with a cylinder on it, it was a rifle. And, uh, that was kind of a modern gun that you could shoot more than one time with. And, uh, he had that, which was kind of a prized possession of his. So that'll come up a little bit later in the discussion. But, so anyway, all these things were going on. The Civil War starts. The South looks like they're going to win the Civil War. By 1861, it starts. By 1862, they marched almost to Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, the Union armies have lost major battles at Manassas and Bull Run. Uh, and so all of these interplays are going on. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, is going on is that the Cherokee join the Confederacy. They sign a treaty with the Confederacy that they'll support the Confederates, and they send warriors to join the Confederate Army to fight the Union. And all of this is going on in the South. And, uh, and if you look into Civil War history, you'll find where the early periods of that war, tremendous amounts of tribal people were in that conflict, from uh, Seminoles to the Cherokee, there's about five different tribes that got tied up in the Confederacy and, and fought in the Confederacy Army. And if you think about it, or at least what I thought about it was, the Cherokee probably had some legitimate gripes. You know, they got removed out of Georgia 30 years before the Civil War started. And so and they had this trail of tears and they lost a lot of people. And, and so that, I'm sure there was a lot of resentment against the United States government because of that. And I think the Confederates played on that and uh, promised them a whole bunch of things that if they won the war, they'd get their lands back and all that. Whether that would happen or not, it's unknown. But the history here shows that there was two Cherokee uh, runners that came up and talked to both the Dakota and the Ojibwe about that the United States was cheating you out of your money, they weren't making your payments because they got this war going on, and they're losing the war, so it's a good time to stand up and defend, you know, and take your land back, and because they aren't paying you, you got the right to take your land back, and instigating trouble. And uh, one of the elderly people here said that we were out in the evening and the moon was up and there was this, the Venus actually was very close to the moon. And they told me, they said, that's when the war starts. When that, when that is close to the moon. And so I, later, when I figured out what that meant, I assumed what they were talking about was that that's when the conflict would start. Um, and then they went on to say that Mille Lacs didn't participate in that conflict, but they said that was the indicator when that was close to the moon, that's when the war would start. And that would make sense because 
this these runners went clear across the west and so how would you coordinate tribes attacking the united states unless you had some couldn't say august 28th or august 18th would be the date because they didn't carry calendars so the idea of some astrological sign would have been much more efficient way of identifying when they should attack. And what we see happening is that in Minnesota, that in August 18th, the Dakota attacked Fort Ripley, not Fort Ripley, Fort Ridgely, which is down by the city of New Orleans. And simultaneously at Leech Lake, they attack the government agency there and capture all the employees and they bring them down to Gull Lake and they barricade them in a stockade at Gull Lake. So this all happened at the same time and theoretically the Ojibwe and the Dakota were pretty violent enemies and so people were having a struggle to try to figure out why was this happening? Because they didn't talk to each other, how would they know that this was happening at the same time? But the, this Cherokee influx agitation would answer a lot of that question about how that all could have occurred and how those two events occurred simultaneously. Well, Mille Lacs didn't really like Day, And so what Day had done before August 18th is he sent runners to the various um, reservations to tell them to come and join him and they were going to join the Dakota and drive all the white people out of Minnesota. That was the plan. And when he got to, when the runners got to Mille Lacs, uh, and again, George Abbott told me part of this story, he said when, when the runners first got to Mille Lacs, from Holland and they, they uh, Mille Lacs people told the runners, oh, we can't make that decision. You gotta go down to Princeton and ask those Ojibwe down there what they think. And so the Ojibwe ran, or, Holland these runners had to run down to Princeton and ask those people what they thought. And they looked at the runners and said, well, the blacks makes that decision. We don't make that decision. You know, you gotta go with it. If Malak says it's okay, then it's okay, but we don't make that decision. So the runners had to run back to Malax, and then when they got back there, then Malax uh, told them that you have no ability to make cannons to fight a war. And we are going to participate with you. And in fact, you go back and tell Holland that if he tries to bring the Ojibwe into this, we'll stand against him on this issue. Question. How many Indians are at Mille Lacs about that time? Uh, there was probably about 12 to 1,500. So, um, so, so that was all kind of stirring there. And then there was a trader right on south of Onamia, and he had a big arsenal of gunpowder and ammunition. And it, for some reason, it was stored there. And so Hole in the Day had told his runners, tell Malax to go take that gunpowder and bring it over. Gull Lake. And so they asked Mille Lacs if they would do that, and then Mille Lacs told them, no, you go tell Holland that if he wants that gunpowder, he should come over here and get it. And so they sent those runners back. Um, that kind of really disrupted Holland the Day's plan to get everybody together to, to make this attack. And so he was hesitant about what to do next. In the meantime, 
the Commissioner of Indian Affairs Dole was coming up the Mississippi River and was at St. Cloud to meet with the Red Lake Band to buy a session of land. And I'll, let me pull back this map because we didn't talk about it. This is session of land in the northwest corner of the state of Minnesota. That session right there. They wanted to buy it. It went into North Dakota too, but they wanted to buy that from the Red Lake Band. And so they were coming up the Mississippi to negotiate a treaty, and it eventually became the Old Crossing Treaty of 1863. But in 1862, they were coming up and they'd gotten the St. Cloud when the conflict broke out, and then everything started to swirl about that. Just the second point, to, just for your information. The, you see that section there, that yellow section around Red Lake? That's how much, that's how big Red Lake was at one time, reservation-wise. And ultimately, they kept chipping off pieces of it till what's left the Red Lake today. But the United States government never owned the land under Red Lake. It never acquired it. All these other reservations, it bought the land and then it put the reservation back so it had this kind of title for a second or two before it created the reservation back again. But at Red Lake, that never happened. It never got acquired the whole session of land. And it, the Red Lake people kept selling off outside parts. And that's why Red Lake is called a Crow's Reservation one of two in the United States, because the United States government never acquired the land underneath the reservation. So. What's the other twelve permits? Um, Idaho. So, so all this is going on. The August is the conflict time. Poland today starts the conflict by capturing all the government agents and agency employees at the Leech Lake Agency, brings them down there. Um, there was a, an Indian agent called Lucas, Lucas Walker. Walker, the city of Walker, that was his brother. Walker was uh, a, a attorney for the lumber industries. And Lucas Walker was an Indian agent for the federal government. And Lucas Walker and Holland and they got into it big time. And just before the August 18th event, um, they got arguing about payments, and all in the day felt that Walker was uh, illegally taking, uh, skimming off the annuity payments from everybody and keeping it. And most of the data indicates that he was probably right, that that's what was going on. And so as this was all rolling out, um, Hold of that he captured these, and some runners came in from. Uh, there was actually a. Uh, he was a, a missionary, Emma Gobble, John Johnson, who was an Episcopal priest, but he was Ogawa, and uh, and he was up in the Gull Lake area running a mission in Columba Mission. <laughs> you can see the sign of it up by by Gull Lake, and he was the. He was a missionary there, and there was there was a certain amount of uh, desire to have missionaries working with tribal people. Tribal people also supported that sometimes. Like Crossing Sky at Rabbit Lake, he 
he sought out somebody to come there and build a church, thinking that that would help stabilize in their position. I'm not sure what they all had in mind, but uh, there wasn't always opposition to the missionaries. But when uh, Poland, they started this, he arrested Gobble too. And then Gobble sent a runner and escaped from that stockade down to tell Walker that, that the Poland was planning to kill everybody at Crowley. So Walker got scared and sent to uh, Fort Ripley to get soldiers to come up and arrest Holland today. And Holland they had come back down to the end of the Gull Lake Reservation to his house and was out walking when these soldiers came to arrest him. And he took off, ran to his house, got his family, and they crossed the river and cut the rope so that the soldiers couldn't get on the other side. And in the process, the uh, soldiers shot at Hole in the Day, and Hole in the Day shot back. Nobody was hurt. Um, but Hole in the Day was pretty upset about being shot at, as one could assume. And so he went back towards the center of Gull Lake by Gull Lake itself. And the soldiers went through his house and took this rifle this, with the revolving uh, cylinder on it and took that. And uh, Poland Day was very upset about that. And then Dole asked to meet with Poland Day uh, to discuss how they could resolve this. And Poland Day would refuse until they gave him his rifle back. And so that was kind of a bargaining point there. Uh, Lucas Walker, he got scared, put his family, there was a stagecoach that ran once a week from Minneapolis to Crowley. So it was not like total isolation of Crowley. It was the end of it, but there was a stagecoach. So he put his family on the stagecoach. He got on the stagecoach. They were headed out of there. When they got to St. Cloud, Dole had sent a messenger to get a hold of Walker to figure out what was going on up there. And when he got there, uh, when he got to St. Cloud, the messenger happened to see the stage and stopped it. And he pulled Walker off to meet with Dole. And Dole uh, listened to Walker, and Walker told him that everybody at Crowing had been killed because Hole in the Day had killed everybody. And then he took off, Walker took off running after that discussion and got them on a cell and by Big Lake uh, allegedly committed suicide. And they didn't find him for a few days, but uh, he was found dead. And that was kind of the end of Lucas Walker and his involvement with his Indian agent. And in later, when Dole finally got to meet with Hole in the Day, it was figured out that once Walker was dead, Hole in the Day was pretty well satisfied that everything would probably be okay after that. Um, so it was really kind of a swirl of events that was going on there. Um, there was a fellow named John Morris who was a half-breed. He was his father was uh, Will, uh, I lost his father's first name. He was one of Morrison County's named after. And, uh, and he was in charge of running back and forth between Hole in the Day and Dole and giving messages back and forth. So he had a kind of unique job. And he said, every day I risk my life that somebody would get mad and shoot me one way or the other. And, uh, but one interesting thing about John Morris, um, he became an expert witness in the Mille Lacs 1913 case that went to the Supreme Court. One of the few Indian people 
that ever became an expert witness to testify for a Supreme Court ruling that was accepted. So it was pretty interesting. He, his name was a Red Feather in Ojibwe, and he ran. He did. Uh, he was a runner, and he would. Uh, the last thing I heard about him is down in the Twin Cities. He ran against a British runner that came all the way from Britain, and he ran barefoot and beat the guy. <laughs> and uh, they had all different kinds of things. That but the 1862 conflict, as that developed and as that came around, um, this is probably more history about that than you guys really want to know, but there was people called border ruffians that were in Minnesota, and they were actually pro-slavers. And this fella, James Tanner, he lived at Crow Wing, and he was he was identified as a as a border ruffian on the census. Uh, he was basically pro-slave, and they went around promoting that concept. His son, John Tanner, joined the Union Army. So I figured that creates some really interesting family dynamics. Um, anyway, he fought through the Civil War. Part of the reason the Dakota got involved was they were, they, their reservation on that ceded territory, they had a strip of land on the Minnesota River, about 10 miles wide, and that's where they were to live and grow food. And they tried to talk them into being gardeners, and that a year it happened to fail, the gardens failed, and so there was food problems. Um, the other problem was the United States didn't have money to pay, so they were delayed. And uh, there was various other reasons that, that impl implemented or impacted why uh, things weren't going very well with the Dakota. And there were two major forts on the frontier. One was Fort Ripley, which is over here on the Mississippi River, and the other one is Fort Ridgely which is by the city of New Albany. And then, since they sound similar, it sometimes gets confusing. Um, we talked a little bit about this conflict with the battle at uh, Fort Ridgely. Um, at New Alm, there was an attack of the city of New Alm, and there was a Judge Flandreau that prevented the city from being overrun. Um, the Ojibwe attacked uh, not only Leech Lake, but also traders at Otter Tail Lake in different places in the north. They captured all of them and brought them to, to uh, Gull Lake. Uh, and then Little Crow became the leader of the Dakota and, and, uh, and uh, um, Olin Day became the leader of the uh, Ojibwe part of that. And just, I placed, put a map in there just to kind of let people look at the distances of things that were going on. You can see where Hollandaise Camp was and Fort Ripley is. Uh, where Hollandaise Camp was, that's a little bit above uh, Guaygal Lake. One of the things that was, is interesting is that the Gull Lake Reservation, when you go into Brainerd and you drive over the Mississippi River, as soon as you drive over it, you're really within the boundaries of the Gull Lake Reservation. And that runs all the way down to the Crow Wing River and then back up on the west side of Baxter. So Baxter is really completely within a reservation. Now, the other interesting thing is there was a court case recently where the judge ruled that uh, the citation issued to a tribal member was invalid because it was occurred within the Gull Lake Reservation. And I don't know what that all consequences of all that is, given now that the Oklahoma decision came down, that's a pretty significant <laughs> decision about 
and you know the kind of a point of benefit for tribal members, and I know there are a number of tribal members who live in Brainerd, um, you essentially were considered off reservation, but now with that Bell Lake decision, you'd be considered on reservation and not subject to state income tax, which could be nice. Question? Mm -hmm. You said that Gull Lake was um, considered a reservation? Was, was there a decision? Yeah, there was a decision by the it was a state court judge on a fishing case. And uh, it was a Thompson was cited with illegal fishing on Gull Lake and was charged and the, the case was dismissed because he was within the boundaries of the Gull Lake Reservation. So it's something that, you know, for people who reside in at least west of the Mississippi in the Baxter area, and I know there's a number of people who live up there, you know, if somebody would ask me five years ago, do I have to pay state income tax, I'd say yes, because <laughs> you don't live on a reservation. But given that ruling, and given the ruling in Oklahoma, it seems like Maybe they don't have to pay state income tax anymore because they live on a reservation. So it'd be something that some somebody, you know, band assembly or somebody should look at because it may benefit the tribal members pretty significantly if they have to pay the state income tax. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's where Lucas Walker was found dead and then the name up there, Mazumane. Um, that was one of the first kind of things that got me involved in the history of the band, was this name, Mazumane. And I'd go around to all the people I could find and say, what does that mean in Ojibwe? You know, what, what, what does that translate? Art used to look at that and he'd say, I don't have no meaning in Ojibwe. Sounds like something. And, yeah, and uh, Julie Shingaby, I asked her about what does that mean, and she said, you know, it don't make any sense. She said, that sounds like an adopted name. And then Larry Smallwood, he looked at it and he said, well, it could be moose, moose, something with moose, you know. Okay. And different people had different kinds of interpretations about what what that name meant. And uh, I have some Dakota friends, and uh, one day, uh, just out of the clear blue sky, I said, what does Mazumane mean in Dakota? And they go, oh, that means walking iron. Just that quick. <laughs> and. Uh, and anyway, in researching out Mazumane, and I don't know if that's how you say that, you know, but the Dakota person picked it up like, like I said, hello. Yeah, it means walking there. And uh, anyway, the Mazumane is of the wolf clan. He was a wolf clan. And the wolf clan within the Ojibwe was created by a Dakota man marrying an Ojibwe woman, and their children became wolf clan. And so what I think went on was that this name followed, followed that clan and was given to, by a namesake, was given to the Zuma name. I just have a comment about that. So was the Ojibwe woman of Lynx clan? I have, that I have no idea. The reason I ask is because my grandma was Lynx clan. Okay. Um, and she was a Kasaba. Uh, she was born in Kumpala. Okay, yep. Yeah, well, there was there was Mazumane out in that region too. A guy named Mazumane. He actually signed the Treaty of 18. Uh, 
37, I think. Um, and he was from the Snake River, St. Croix River Valley. And that's where Mazuma came from and moved to South End of the And so would that be, now it's uh, at Point? Yep. Yep. That's where he lived. And uh, he was a pretty famous individual at the time. So after Hole in the Day's runners came, go ahead. So in Ojibwe, Z's, ZH's, and Z's, they are interchangeable with N's. So Menominee, it sounds like, would, where that would come from. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I could not find anyone who could really kind of nail that down as to how that is. But when I saw the connection between the Dakota and the Wolf Clan, that that's how the Wolf Clan got created, and that Mazumane was of the Wolf Clan, it seemed to me that somebody gave namesake, used that name, and gave it to him, and oh, you know, maybe he was the third Mazumane or the fourth or whatever. Uh, but the, the Dakota and the Ojibwe got along at some period of time. There was earlier histories than when they, they when they did get along, and I think that kind of why you know Malax people drove them out of Malax Lake. That that narrative. Um, you know, before that whole thing turned bad, they seemed like they were inter going back and forth quite a bit. And so the idea that a name could follow from the Dakota uh, is pretty interesting. Where, what happened then was in 1862, uh, when the Mille Lacs heard that Hole in the Day had started taking cap capturing people and the dole was there. Mazumane took 150 warriors and walked the Little Falls and told, maybe he was a good friend with Nathaniel Richardson, who was the mayor of Little Falls. And uh, he went there and they were petrified, the mayor said, <laughs> because of what they'd all heard about what was going on. This was like September 4th of 1862. And they were seeing all these warriors coming into Little Falls and they were petrified. And then Mazumane was leading that and Richardson knew him and so he talked to him. And they said, no, we come here to tell you we're gonna protect you. <laughs> That's why we're here, we're, protect we're gonna protect you from the Dakota. And we're gonna leave tomorrow and we're going up to Fort Ripley. So that's what they did. Uh, and then by the end of the day, the, the women of Little Falls cooked a big meal and fed everybody. And then from there they left and went up to, uh, to Fort Ripley to meet with Dole, who was at the fort at the time, trying to set up a meeting with Hole of the day. So from the 18th to the 6th of September, Dole still hadn't been able to meet with Hole in the Day. And there was a whole bunch of squabbling going back and forth. And so Mille Lacs warriors walked up there, which frightened the fort, because <laughs> they didn't know whose side they were on. Shabashkin came over from Mille Lacs. Uh, so there was a whole entourage of people that showed up at Fort Ripley. And basically there to support Dole and uh, hold him so. And, and it was interesting because Dole had heard about that Mille Lacs had uh, resisted Hull in the day, so he had sent letters back and forth in communications, and that's how they ended up going over there to meet with him. So it was a lot of dynamics that was rolling around at that time. Anyway, so Mzuma and I went over there, talked with Dole, everything calmed down with, in regards to Malax. And then I run across 
it was called the Adjunct General's Report. Adjunct General is, you might have heard of him just recently in the riots in, in Minneapolis that's brought up the National Guard. Well, there was an Adjunct General back in 1862 too, and he wrote a report to the state legislature saying, you know, we were extremely concerned that the Ojibwe would enter into this conflict with the Dakota, and we were particularly concerned because of the closeness of Mille Lacs to the Twin Cities, that this could be very bad. And so we got the governor of Wisconsin to send a general and the chief from Fond du Lac over to talk to Mille Lacs to try to make them remain neutral. So that's how he starts out his report. <laughs> and he said, and we did find out that that whole effort was probably for naught because Mille Lacs had already decided that they were going to oppose all of the thing. And then he went on to talk about how Mille Lacs opposed all of the day and, and this whole scenario. So there is a record of that. And it becomes important because right now, Mille Lacs is in litigation over the reservation boundaries. And all of these things are tied to that, this 1862 conflict, because after this conflict, there was a new treaty signed in 1863 that ceded the Chippewa of the Mississippi reservations with the exemption that Mille Lacs shall be exempt and shall not be removed as long as they don't molest the persons and properties of the whites. And so that's where Mille Lacs gets this non-removable status about is from the treaties of 1863 and 64 that they shall not be removed, hence not removable. When I first started working for the band in, in 74 in the Onega High School, I was, uh, I was asked, or I asked about, what does this non-removable Mille Lacs mean? And the people in in Onavia said, well, that means they were supposed to remove, but wouldn't. <laughs> so that was their interpretation. And when I asked at Mille Lacs, they said, no, we're non-removable. We can't be removed. We're here. You know, we're not supposed to be removed. So there was these two absolutely opposite positions about what that language meant, and nobody could tell me what it meant. You know. Where did they come from? Why was it there? You know, they just had these two positions that they hung to, and uh, and no, you know, nobody in Omania could figure out or looked at or tried to why why they believed what they did. Just that it means they were supposed to remove, but wouldn't. And so anyway, all of this went on, and so Mazumane went didn't get involved with even attacking Holland the day. He just came back. But on, on September 10th, then, Holland the day finally agreed to meet with Dole at Crowley. And the people that were there that made a record of it said it was so tense, they felt that if somebody would have sneezed, everybody would have been killed. It was, it was that tense of a meeting. And, uh, Anyway, Hole in the Day and Dole discussed this thing, and that's when uh, Hole in the Day was told that Lucas Walker was dead, and that's when he kind of said, okay, left. <laughs> and, uh, and that was really the, pretty much the end of the involvement of the Dakota, or the Ojibwe in the Dakota conflict. But there wasn't anything beyond that. Although the governor of Minnesota, was very concerned, and part of this was that Dole was of one political party, and we talk about you know this uh, divisiveness between the Republicans and the Democrats today. Well, at that time, Dole was of one party, Ramsey, the governor, was of the other party, and they were, you know, Ramsey was calling Dole a chicken because he wouldn't go up there, and. and 
and Dole was asking for support from the military, and, and Ramsey was saying, well, get your own support, you know, <laughs> and just back and forth. And so when Dole left, Ramsey said, well, I'm going to make a treaty with Hole in the Day. And so Ramsey got a bunch of state legislatures and went up to Hole in the Day, and on the 16th and 17th of September, they worked out a treaty with Hole in the Day. And they took it back down and passed it in the state legislature. And then they sent it to Washington, and Washington said, you have no right to make a treaty with Hole in the Day, and threw it out. And so it became a null issue. But there was that much stuff going on. It was pretty unique to the situation at the time. But, uh, yeah, so the other thing that was required that Ramsey had to get permission from Dole to go into the reservation to meet with Hole in the Day. That they, they didn't, state governor didn't have authority to go into the reservation unless they got federal approval. And Dole begrudgingly sent the letter saying, yeah, you can go talk to Hole in the Day after he left. But there was lots of dynamics going on. Then what Mazumane did with his 150 warriors he went to St. Cloud, which was recruiting soldiers for the volunteers to fight the Dakota. And so they went off and they went, walked down to St. Cloud and then the, the adjunct general down there said, no, you can't because you're a tribal person. You can't volunteer. And, and so then there was a big discussion. Henry Rice, who was a senator, got involved, and Ramsey got involved. And then they finally decided that, yeah, they can be a volunteer. And so they went back down there and they formed G Company of the Ninth Volunteers of Minnesota. And they were sent to Fort Abercrombie to fight the Dakota out there. And they were pretty merciless once they got out there. Uh, and, Anyway, they went on to fight in the Civil War, and, and uh, maybe we, I don't know, we kind of want to take a break here. Or? Are there a break? Yeah. I don't know how long I've been babbling. Let's take about 15 minutes, huh? 15.